hello everyone welcome back to my channel my name is piyush and if you are a returning viewer to my channel you might have already seen azure devops zero to hero series we have published 13 videos so far and there are three videos pending um, but lot of you have asked me this question are there any prerequisite to this series especially for those who are new to cloud or new to azure itself so that is why i am publishing this video to cover all the basic fundamentals of azure and cloud computing itself this is going to be a two and a half hour long video approximately and it will cover everything that is there as part of az900 uh, fundamental certification exam and by the end of this video you will be able to build solid understanding of all the cloud fundamentals including azure networking uh, all the azure services that are specifically for beginners point of view and this will be helpful in uh, understanding azure devops as well because we'll be using a lot of these services that scene so without any further ado let's start with this video. so let's start with the very basic what exactly is cloud computing before that we need to understand why do we actually need it imagine you are the owner of a small it firm and you want to scale your business However, you would need a large number of resources to make that expansion possible, such as office space, more hardware, more furniture, a lot of people to manage all these and a lot of money for everything. These one time upfront expenses are also known as capex or capital expenditures. Then you would also have some recurring expenses such as cost of regular hardware maintenance, salaries to employees, electricity bills of the office, monthly building rentals and so on. These recurring operating expenses are called OPEX or operational expenses. These are nothing but the roadblocks for this expansion and your goal is to minimize your CAPEX and OPEX and build a system that is highly scalable, highly available and fault tolerant, a system with built-in security, and high performance enters cloud computing cloud computing is a way to access these computer resources and services over the internet instead of having to buy and manage it yourself imagine that you need to run a software program to store a large amount of files instead of buying that hard disk drive you rent a storage service such as aws s3 or azure storage or gcp blob storage and it will provide you that access over the internet where you can store your files and make use of it remotely. So buying hardware is old school. Renting hardware is what cloud computing is all about. Now let's talk about the difference between IES, PaaS and SaaS. IES as the name suggests infrastructure as a service, PaaS is platform as a service and SaaS is software as a service. IS gives you full control over the infrastructure resources such as your virtual machine storage. You can rent these resources from a cloud provider and configure them as needed to run your own application. Right? You install your own operating system and you configure all your custom applications. You take care of uh, all the management tasks and administrative tasks and you have basically the full control over your operating system and your infrastructure. But in PaaS, they will provide you a runtime environment and a platform to deploy your application and development tools. You do not get access to the underlying operating system. You get access to their environment in which you can deploy your application and start using it. In SaaS, they would provide you the application that you can consume directly as an end user. So these uh, software applications that are hosted on cloud and run by the cloud provider, you just use them as the user. In IES, you must take care of all the administrative tasks such as server patching, upgrades, backups. Patching is nothing but making sure all your softwares and your operating system packages are up to date and have all the fixes of uh, security and vulnerability. Um, in PaaS and SaaS, Azure takes care of all your admin tasks, right? So as we said, when you need full control over your operating system, you go with IES. When you 
do not want to take care of all your admin tasks, you go with either PaaS or SaaS. IS models are mostly pay per use. You pay whatever service you use for a particular duration. Services such as Amazon EC2, Azure VMs, or GCP Compute Engine. PaaS models are mostly service based models such as Azure Web App. SaaS models are mostly subscription based such as uh, your Gmail application, your Office 365 subscription, your Dropbox, all these are SaaS application where you do not deploy anything. You just use the application, the standard version of the application. So lift and shift migration is uh, nothing but uh, when you have to move your applications hosted on premises to the cloud infrastructure so that you get all the benefits of cloud, but you do not want to make any changes to your application. So that is called lift and shift. IS would be the ideal choice because you get full control over your operating system and you can customize your application as you need. As model is again the ideal choice where you do not want to take care of your admin task or you do not need the uh, underlying operating system access and you just want to focus on your application deployment and just start using it. SaaS model is the ideal choice when you can use the standard version of a cloud application without making any customizations. Like if you want to use a Google workspace application such as Gmail, you just start using it. You just uh, take the subscription and start using it. You do not deploy your own version of Gmail on top of that. You basically don't have access to do that. So SaaS is the choice in that case. Now, the next one is a shared responsibility model. Shared responsibility model is nothing but an agreement between customer and Microsoft that there are certain responsibilities that will be taken care by Microsoft. There are certain responsibilities that will be taken care by you as the customer and some responsibilities will be shared among both of the parties. So for example, let's say you have an on-prem application when you work on that everything from your physical data center, from your physical network, physical host, your operating system, networking, application, everything, right? Everything is taken care by customer. That means you or if you have hired some third party uh, organization to manage all that, right? So there is nothing that will be taken care by Microsoft or any cloud provider. When you move to IS, you basically do not worry about the physical infrastructure. So all the physical data center, physical network, physical host, these things will be taken care by Microsoft and you can just focus on your operating system and rest of the things like right? your application, your network controls, all of those things. But when you move to PaaS, Yes, Microsoft manages your physical aspects of the infrastructure, but they also manages your operating system, right? So this is the main difference between IAS and PaaS. In IAS, your operating system is managed by you, right? In PaaS, your operating system is managed by Azure. And these three responsibilities, identity and directory service, uh, like Azure Active Directory and or your applications or your networking control, these are the shared responsibilities between you and the customer. When you move to SaaS, right, so again, the physical responsibilities of the infrastructure will be taken care of Microsoft along with the operating system as it was there in PaaS. And on top of that, your application and network control will also be taken care by Microsoft. And you just have to focus on your information data, your devices from which you will be managing the application and your accounts and identities. Like if you are configuring single sign-on or OAuth authentication or like LDAP, anything would be taken care by you only as the customer. All right, so let's have a look at the difference between public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. In public cloud, resources are shared among multiple users and customers only pay for the resources that they use. 
these public clouds are the cloud providers such as AWS, Azure, GCP, Oracle Cloud and there are many more. In private cloud, resources are not shared with other organizations which provides greater control and security. So these are generally the organization that have their own data center and they help other customers to host their workload on their data center. In hybrid cloud, customer uses both public and private cloud in an interconnected environment. Public clouds are generally hosted and operated by a third party cloud service provider such as AWS, Azure, GCP, Alibaba, Oracle and so on. Private clouds are normally operated and maintained by a single organization. A private cloud may be hosted on premises or in a data center. So generally it's a private data center from some cloud provider. Hybrid cloud provide extra layer of security as you can choose which resources to keep in private cloud and which resources to deploy in public cloud. Let's take an example. Public cloud is like taking a bus where other passengers will also share the ride with you and you don't have to worry about the physical maintenance or the capital expenditure and you only pay when you ride the bus, which is pay per use. Private cloud, however, is like driving your own car where you buy the car first, which is a capital expenditure and you are responsible for its maintenance, but you get more control over it. Like who can drive the car or who can ride with you? You can lock it up in a garage, hence provide more control over the security as well. Hybrid cloud is like a combination of both. You drive to work on your own car, but you use public commute when driving elsewhere. This allows you to take the advantage of both the features. In public cloud, there is generally no or minimum capital expenditure to scale up. In private cloud, there is a high capital expenditure as you first buy the servers, even if there is the private data center. In public cloud, resources can be provisioned or decommissioned on demand and you only pay for what you use. However, in private cloud, you purchase the hardware first before you start using the services. In hybrid cloud, resources can be added on demand by scaling up in the public environment. So let's say you are using a hybrid cloud where you have your own premises infrastructure as well as your cloud infrastructure. Whenever you want to scale up, you add your resources in the cloud infrastructure rather than the on-prem infrastructure. In that way, you can save the additional capital expenditure on that. All right, so let's talk about the benefits of using cloud computing. The first one is high availability and fault tolerance. It means that your application is designed and configured to be available even if there is any hardware or software failure and will always be responding to the customers and the traffic. So let's have a look at with the help of an example. You have your user which is accessing an application. This application is accessible via a load balancer DNS. But let's for the sake of uh, simplicity, let's just call it an app. And it has a backend server which is VM1. And it has another backend server VM2. So it is designed in such a way that even if there is a VM failure, application will still be able to respond back to the customer using VM2, right? And the same way these VMs are listening to a database on the backend, let's call it DB1. This is your master DB and then there is a DB2, which is your read only or slave database. So these are replicated synchronously. So even if there is a database failure, your application will still be able to respond to the customer using the secondary database. Right? So this is how the application was designed so that even if a failure happen, it should always be responding to the customer and it is available all the time. Let's have a look at another example. Let's say in case when VM2 goes down, the application, there will be a lot of load on VM1. Let's say it was running on 50% CPU utilization, but with the traffic of VM2 being redirected to VM1, 
the load will increase to let's say 90%. To avoid that situation and to avoid the VM1 to crash, we can put these VMs behind a VM scale set. So if you have worked with AWS before, it is like auto scaling group. Like if you do not know about it, don't worry, we will cover this in, uh, in the coming lectures. So just, uh, I'll just quickly explain it to you what it is. So VM scale set is nothing but it has a template, right? So whenever there is a failure, let's say the VM2 goes down, using this template over here, VM scale set will provision a new VM. So now the app will be listening to VM1 and VM3. It will make sure that we always have at least two instances listening to the app front end. Right now, let's talk about uh, another important uh, benefit, which is scalability. Scalability is nothing but the ability of the system to adjust according to the demand. Let's say you have customer which is accessing an application right this application has only one backend which is vm1 there is not a lot of load on the server right now hence uh, whenever customer is accessing the application he is able to get the reply back from the application but as soon as we have number of users increase let's say the user count has increased from 1 to 10 and all of them will be accessing this application at the same time, then this server will be in on high load, right? There will be high CPU utilization, high memory utilization and whatnot. In the regular scenario, this application will crash and the user will not be able to get any results back. So this will result in a bad customer experience and might be revenue loss. Avoid that. There is this concept of scalability in which we can either replace this VM to a bigger VM, let's say VM2. VM2 will have more power, more uh, RAM and all the resources that is required to be accessed by these many users, right? So VM1 will be replaced by VM2. So this type of scaling is known as vertical scaling in which we are replacing the existing infrastructure with a bigger infrastructure. Now this scalability has certain disadvantages. One of them will be there would be some downtime in this process. Like when you provision a new VM and replace that with the older VM in that time when the switch is happening, there would be downtime that customer will be facing. And this is not possible to do that, like let's say 10 times a day. Whenever there is sudden increase in the traffic, you would want to replace it with a bigger VM. When it is cooled down, you want to replace it again back with the smaller VM. It is not a feasible solution to do every time. What we want to do is we would want to add some additional VMs to handle the load. Let's say we added three more VMs. So instead of VM1, we have VM1, VM2 and VM3. So this VM will still be there and we added two additional VMs to handle the load. Right? So this type of scalability is called horizontal scalability. So there are a lot of benefits with the horizontal scalability. Let's say you have 10 users and you have scale out your system to three VMs. But whenever the users stopped accessing the application, there is let's say just one user the application should be able to scale down back to one VM. Right? Because we are on a consumption based model, so we should be able to scale down as well whenever there is not a lot of load on the system. What we have uh, learned so far. So let's say you have this VM1. When you want to replace this VM1 with the bigger VM, VM2. So this one is no longer existed and this is your active VM. So this type of scalability is called vertical scaling. And in the same way, when you have VM1 over here, 
and to handle the additional load you are adding few more vms say vm2 and vm3 so this kind of scaling is called horizontal scaling just remember horizontal scaling is the preferred method in most of the cases but sometimes vertical scaling is also preferable as per the use case it would have some downtime and this is not a favorable solution but then we have elasticity so elasticity is similar to scalability it's just elasticity happen automatically that means instead of someone manually scaling up or down the system there should be a mechanism like in aws we have auto scaling groups which takes care of this feature in azure we have vm scale set in gcp we have instance groups So these all services will make sure that system will be able to scale up and down based on the demand. The next benefit of using cloud is cost effectiveness. So we have two important concepts such as pricing calculator and then ECO, which is total cost of ownership. In pricing calculator, we can estimate the price of using azure services like let's say you need to have a vm with 12 gigs of memory and 80 gb of hard disk hdd in us central one and all the other features like uh, availability and uh, performance and everything and based on that, this pricing calculator will provide you an estimated cost. So you have something that you could uh, treat that as estimate and work on that. With total cost of ownership, it's like when you have to calculate the cost of uh, ownership when you move from on-premises to cloud. So it provides you an estimate of cost on how much you are uh, paying on on-premises and how much you will be paying in cloud. Based on that, it will tell you how much cost you will be saving when you move to cloud. Right? So it will be a summary report. There would be some report generated. So we will be looking into these two concepts, pricing calculator and total cost of ownership at the end of this course. But for now, just uh, remember these two points that I have discussed. Pricing calculator is to provide the estimate of cost for using Azure services and total cost of ownership provide you estimate of total savings that you could have when migrating from on-premises to cloud. All right, so this is how a typical resource hierarchy in Azure will look like. At the root level of your Azure is your Azure account. When you create an Azure account, a default subscription will be created for you. Let's say this one, and then you can have multiple additional subscription created. For example, your company might want to use a single subscription for your sales department and a separate subscription for your IT department. So you could keep them on a separate subscription. In coming video, I will show you the demo of Azure portal. Then you have a better idea about the resource hierarchy. Now each subscription can have one or more resource group. Like for example, this sales subscription has these two resource group and this IT subscription has one resource group and you can just uh, keep your environment separated using these resource groups such as your dev and UAT environment in a separate resource group and a prod environment in a separate resource group. So resource groups are nothing but the logical separation of resources together and when you apply some permission at resource group level it will be inherited by the resources. The same way if you apply some permission at subscription level it will be inherited by the subsequent resource groups and the resources. So this follows a top-down approach like whenever there is a policy permission or governance applied at the root level or the top level of the tree. Now each resource group can contain one or more resources for example this dev resource group has Azure VM, Azure Function, Cosmos DB, 
and this resource group has a SQL database. This resource group has a Azure function app. But one resource can only be part of one resource group. Right? For example, this SQL database, it could be only part of this resource group and it cannot be part of this or this resource group. Now let's talk about the management groups. You organize your subscription in the container called management group. You have your root management group and inside that you could have multiple management groups such as one for HR, one for IT, one for marketing and so on. And each management group can further have certain management groups or the subscriptions. All subscription within a management groups, for example, these two subscription, they will inherit the permission applied at marketing and and the permission at root management. So this like this is the same diagram that we have seen. It just we have added the management groups as part of it. This also follows the same hierarchy. All the permission applied. Let's say this is the tree structure. So all the permission applied at the root level of the tree or the parent node will be inherited by the subsequent child nodes. So creating the management groups, this is an optional task. Like this is not a mandatory thing to do, but creating at least one subscription is mandatory. So like I said in the previous slide, one subscription will be created for you automatically when you create an Azure account. Now, when we try to combine these two diagrams together, it will look something like this. So you have your Azure account at the root level. It can have one or more management groups. Like let's say there is one root management groups and inside that there are multiple management groups. And then we have multiple subscription. Subscription has resource group and then resources. If you apply certain permission over here, let's say you apply deny all to a particular resource that permission because it is at the root level it will be applied till here till the resource level so that means these resource will also doesn't have that permission unless you explicitly add that permission over here then it will override all right i'm in my web browser i'll just quickly google sign up azure did a type over there but it's okay so the first link over here microsoft azure get your free trial it should be the one that you will be clicking. I'll click on that. And it will ask you to start free or pay as you go. Click over here, start free. And then it will ask you the Microsoft login account details. So enter your email address over here. And your password. And it will email the code to you. So I enter my code. If you are using your Microsoft Live account for the first time, it will ask you some details. So let's put those details. Okay, hit next. Confirm your age. Okay, next. Hit sign in. Okay, now it will again ask you some basic details. Over here, text me to verify your identity. Put the verification code. Verify code and you enter the rest of the details. Okay, next. Okay, it'll ask you your uh, credit card details. Put everything and hit sign up. You can go over here, portal.azure.com, and uh, this is like your AWS console, but for Azure. So this is Azure portal. Let's quickly see the navigation menu. So over here on the left side, where you see three uh, lines you click on that it will show you all the different resources that we have in azure and you can pin your favorite resources or you can click over here all services you can create a new resource by many ways one is this one create a resource other is use the resource from this side or you can go over here and hit create resource from this plus sign okay and you just search the resource from different categories or search it over here or just click over the resource if you see you know let's say web app so hit create there are many different ways and there is this way as well so if you go back and hit over here in the search 
just enter anything let's say virtual machine and your resource will be visible over here right so like aws like gcp it also has a lot of uh, options to access your resource okay so that is the console menu now over here on the right side if you see this is from where you can start your cloud shell you click on that it will ask you to select your subscription and then because your cloud shell needs a storage account it creates storage where your all the temporary files will be located and it will be a persistent storage that means that means your file will not be deleted so once the storage account is created it is just for the first time one time thing and it will connect you to the cloud shell so cloud shell is like terminal attached to this cloud portal so when you can run where you can run uh, unix commands or windows powershell commands to access the cloud services over here if you see on this menu it says bash because this uh, default shell is bash but you can click on the drop down and you can change it to powershell as well so you can use uh, either of those as per your needs now you can run az command line because this cloud shell already has az command line tool installed so you can run uh, az cli commands let's say az hyphen hyphen help it already has that az cli tool installed so it will show you different options that you can use right but we will be looking that later in the course but for now i just wanted to uh, show you how it will look like now if you want to like there is this option to restart cloud shell as well from here then we have settings which will basically pop up the setting of this terminal window then from here you can upload and download the files just simply click on that it will be like uh, like how you do in your windows machine and you can open a new session from here or you can open the editor over here this will be command line but if you want an IDE environment such as visual code you click on that open editor and it will show you something like this let's say you have a file bash profile so you can just edit the file from here instead of going through the vi editor you can just close it from here on the right side i close the cloud shell so let me click it again okay and on the right side if we see this was the cloud shell then this is directories and subscription so if i go to this it will show my subscription currently i have one subscription which is the default subscription that it is showing over here as well default directory and if you if you are part of multiple subscription then you can switch back and forth between the subscription over here will be your notifications when you make any operation or any change in the service over here is the settings again like directory and service subscription etc this would be your settings support and troubleshooting you can create the support tickets if if your plan allows it so over here help and support you can create a support ticket with azure so let's start with the basic concepts of data centers well these are the facilities with resources arranged in racks with a dedicated power pooling and networking infrastructure when you create a virtual machine or a storage disk or any other gcp service it will be deployed in one of these data centers physically the collection of one or more data centers is referred to as an availability zone these data centers are usually miles apart within an availability zone and the collection of multiple availability zones in a geographical location is referred to as a region such as us east and us west are two separate regions but please remember not all regions support availability zones let's talk about region pairs azure regions are paired with another region within the same geography at least 300 miles away to replicate the resources Let's say if there is any interruption to service due to events like natural disaster, civil unrest or any power outage in one region and the whole region goes down, the services will automatically fail over to the other region in its region pair and the customer would not be impacted. It provides an even 
higher availability of services to the customer. All right, as you can see, I have logged into my Azure portal with portal.azure.com and I have to create a new virtual machine now. So again, as I have previously told you, how do we create a new resource? There are several ways. I'm just gonna search it over here and click on virtual machine, right? So there are no machines running at the moment. You go over here and hit create. There are several options. So you choose the first one as your virtual machine. Now let's go these uh, options over here one by one. First one is subscription. So if you are using an Azure free trial, you have a different value over here. For me, I have already upgraded to pay as you go subscription. Then the next part is resource groups. So again, like I have told you before, resource group are nothing but the logical separation of resources in a group. You can create a separate group for your dev environment, test environment, prod environment. You can club those resources together and you can delete all the resources in a resource group by just deleting the resource group. So this is a good way to organize your resources, right? And most of the Azure resources would need to have you have the resource group provision before you can use that resource. If we already have some resource group created, you can just uh, select it from here. Let's create a new resource group by clicking over here, create new, and now give this resource group a name. Demo Piyush, okay, click OK. Now the resource group is created as simple as that. Let's give this virtual machine a name. SVM Piyush and select the region where you would want this virtual machine to physically exist. So for example, US East, this is the region in which I am provisioning my virtual machine. Now set the availability options like how redundant you would want this virtual machine to be. So you can select availability zone, virtual machine, availability sets. These two terms, virtual machine, scale set and availability set, we haven't seen yet, which we will be covering in the next video, but we have already seen availability zones. So I am selecting the zone, let's say zone one. This will be the zone where my virtual machine will be existed physically. Then security type is, like let's keep it standard for now. Over here, you can choose your virtual machine image, like what type of VM you would want to create, Ubuntu, Red Hat, or you can even create Windows machines as well. So you have a lot of options to choose from, right? For this demo, I'll be creating an Ubuntu server. So let's click over here. Right. Then you specify your VM size over here. So cost of your virtual machine depend on a lot of factors such as storage, uh, VM size, and all these options like high availability options. Click over here, see all sizes. Right. And so these are the all the available sizes we have. I'll choose the smallest one so that I could pay the minimum amount, right? So if you see B1, this one over here, it has 0.5 RAM, two gigs of data disk, uh, one CPUs that should be sufficient for our use case. And then there are other machine types and sizes as well, right? So there are a lot to choose from, but for this demo, let's just uh, use this one okay, and click select. So I have selected this machine. Now the authentication type, whether you would want to uh, SSH using an SSH public key or a password. So here would be your default username as your user. You can change the name as well. And you would want to use any existing public key or generate a new key pair. Let's uh, use this one, generate new key pair. And key pair name would be this one, test VM use key. I hope this is visible. Right. Now, we need to select the inbound ports as well, because if you need to enable a communication with your virtual machine, you would need to SSH into the virtual machine. First, you would have to allow port 22, which is an SSH port. This port needs to be open before you enter into the virtual machine. So over here, let's select the default one and click over here next. Now it says what type of OS disk you need. 
So there are different options again, premium SDD, standard SSD, premium SSD, premium SSDs are the high performance disk, right? So compare this with your uh, computer system, you have your SDD, then you have your SSD. SSDs are really high performing disk. So I'll just choose standard SSD for this demo purpose. And you have, again, there are two types of redundancies. If you see over here, local redundant storage, and then zone redundant storage. Local redundant storage means your disk will be locally replicated in a single data center. That means if that data center has some issues, if it fails, then your data would be unavailable for that time. But in zone redundant storage, your data is replicated across three zones. So even if you lose two zones, you still have that data available from the third zone. Right. So this is how you can again achieve high availability. But for this demo, let me just choose standard SSD. This OS disk is nothing but your boot disk. That means it's not persistent by default. You see our option delete with VM. That means when you delete your VM, this disk will also be deleted. But you can uncheck this box to make it persistent disk. Right. For now, I'll just keep it the default way delete with VM. And you can have some additional disk as well. You click over here, create and attach a new disk. And then you have to uh, format the file system and mount that uh, volume on top of that. But we are not doing that at the moment. So I just wanted to uh, let you know that. Then we have some advanced options, right? I'll just keep it default. Click over here, which says networking, right? So we have virtual network, subnet, public IP. There are a lot of networking concepts over here. And this I will be covering in the networking section of this course. So for now, just understand virtual network is an isolated network in a data center where your all the resources will be provisions, where your all resources will reside, right? So I am creating a new virtual network through this uh, wizard and it has a subnet of 10.0.0 slash 24. This is a CIDR range, which, which will be having a lot of IPs and we will do the IP calculation as well later in the course. And we have a public IP associated with it. So there are different type of IPs. We have public IP. We have the internal IP. Public IP is nothing but uh, IP that is accessible over the public internet. If you do not attach a public IP with this virtual machine, you would not be able to SSH into that. Also, you cannot install any web application on top of that, right? So public IP you generally used in a web facing application and it is not meant for the database or any other secure applications. We have already opened the public inbound ports on port 22. If you want to place this virtual machine behind a load balancer, but uh, we are just using one virtual machine at the moment. So there is no need for that. Click on management. And again, it will ask you some uh, additional features such as login with Azure Active Directory. We will have a session uh, like a separate session for Azure Active Directory and some other options to enable backup or enable auto shutdown. Right? Then we have monitoring. In monitoring, you can enable alerts or you can enable boot diagnostic. I'll just keep it disabled for now. Then click over here next. Okay. Here is your custom data. Custom data is nothing but the script or commands that you would want to run when your uh, VM starts. Like if I want to install certain uh, applications because uh, with virtual machines is an IAS, we have the capability to install the custom applications on top of it. So from this particular section, you can do that automatically, such as let's say sudo apt-get update. If I do that, then um, this command will run once the VM boot up. So that's what it is. And then there are some advanced features, which is not really required at the moment. So I'll click on here next tag. You can select your tags over here. Tags is generally required in case of reporting and analytics purpose. So let me just keep it default for now and hit review and create. Once you do that, it will provide you all the basic details that you have entered along with the cost 
that you will be charged uh, by using this virtual machine and all the other things right so you verify everything and once you do that click create now it will take some time and it will provision a virtual machine for you before that you can download your private key from here uh, you will only been asked to select this option one time before you provision your virtual machine and after that this will not appear again so make sure you download your private key before you move ahead so click over here okay i have downloaded the virtual machine private key which is dot pem extension now it says deployment is in progress that means your virtual machine deployment provisioning of your virtual machine is in progress it will take some time and it will provision the virtual machine for you so along with the virtual machine it is creating some additional resources if you see over here it created a network interface public ip address virtual network network security group network security group is nothing but the inbound rules that we have enabled so we have enabled ssh access on port 22 so that's what it is now it says the deployment has been completed you can go to the resource so over here is your virtual machine it's currently running that that is why this start option is disabled but you can restart it from here stop it from here or delete the virtual machine Right. So you can review all the details from here, all the things that it has created right? and all the other options such as networking. Right. So this is your SSH rule that you have enabled from any source. That means from any IP. This is not, uh, by the way, this is not a secure rule. You should always mention your source CIDR range, like from where you are logging or if you are behind a corporate network. So you put your CIDR range over here so that it is not accessible to everyone because I will be just deleting this virtual machine after this demo. So I have just kept it default, which is any and destination is any services SSH on port 22. Okay. So this will allow me to SSH into the virtual machine. And there are some default rules that is created by default for you. So please have a look at those as well. And then we have different options to connect like you connect with an SSH client or a bastion host right so these are the instructions as well it says your private keys should only have the permission of uh, 400 and then you provide a path to your SSH private key and you run this command from your terminal window right or you can use uh, applications such as putty or super putty to log into your virtual machine and there are all others options like your disk this is the default os disk that we have used and we have not created any data disk that is why this field is blank and all other options that you can review and we will cover most of these in the later sections so this is how you can provision a virtual machine. Let's quickly see what exactly is VM scale set and then I will show you the Azure portal as well. So let's assume your application is accessible to the external user through a load balancer, which is the front facing of your application and behind your load balancer as the backend, you have your virtual machine. Let's call it VM one. Now let's say if a disaster hits or the VM crashes or due to any reason the VM is not responding to the load balancer your application will fail to respond to your user and the user will not be getting any response back from the website so this scenario is called a single point of failure so here the application is not highly available now to avoid a single point of failure and make your application highly available we use something called as virtual machine scale sets. So in this virtual machine scale set, we provision multiple VMs. Let's call them VM1, VM2, and VM3. So this is VMSS1. And this is listening to your load balancer as the front end. And here is your user accessing the application through your load balancer. Now let's say if 
VM1 goes down, then virtual machine scale set will provision another VM. Call it VM4. And it will make sure that certain number of VMs are always available and ready to serve the traffic. It has another important benefit, which is automatic scaling. So we have already seen scale out and horizontal scaling and vertical scaling in our previous videos. So the same happens over here. Let's say your CPU utilization goes above 75% for a particular VM. Let's call it this one. VM2 reaches the threshold of 75%. Then virtual machine scale set, it will provision another VM. VM5 to balance the load. This process is called scale out. Now, because your load on the server was high, that is why we had to provision a new VM. But when load goes down, it should automatically scale back to its original position, right? So that process is called scale in. So let's say when CPU utilization goes less than 25%, it will do the scale in and destroy the VM. And it will make sure that the three VMs are always up and running to balance the load. So I hope the VM scale set concept is clear to you now. Now let's uh, move into Azure portal and see how we can create a virtual machine scale set. Uh, now let's go into Azure portal. And over here, search for virtual machine scale sets or VMSS. Over here. And now you see a button over here which says create. Click over there. And then it will ask you the basic details like it was there in a virtual machine wizard. So you provide your subscription name, resource group name and virtual machine scale sets name. So let me use the existing one, demo Piyush and virtual machine scale set VMSS1. You select the region in which you want your virtual machine to exist. And then over here, you select your availability zones because this provides you high availability by spreading VMs across multiple zones. So you can select one or more VM so that even if there is a zone failure, if a zone goes down completely, you still have the VMs up and running from the other available zones. So let me select VM one, two and three so that it could spread the workload across all the available zones. And over here we have two orchestration mode. One is uniform. Another one is flexible. The default one is uniform in which you deploy the identical VMs as part of the virtual machine scale sets. In flexible, you can deploy identical or multiple machine types. So you can click over here or hover the mouse over here and it will provide you all those details that we just have uh, discussed, right? So feel free to have a look at that. So I'll go with the default one, which is uniform. And I keep everything as default image type Ubuntu should be good with us and machine type. Let me keep it as it is. And then we have the same things that we have seen as part of the virtual machine. The other difference that it has is if you go to the scaling section over here, right? If you click over here, you see initial instance count. So as we have seen virtual machine scale set could have multiple VMs serving as the backend. So you can put your initial count of VMs that it should have. Let's use number three. So this machine will have three VMs as part of the initial count. Then there is this scaling policy, right? Whether you would want to scale your VMs based on your manual criteria, like you will be, someone would be clicking it manually, or there is a better way to do that, which is over here, custom. In custom, you provide basic details such as minimum number of instances, maximum number of instances. So this virtual machine scale set cannot have more than 10 VMs, even if the load is at its highest. So that is why the number is 10 over here. You can 
put a higher number over here like if that is your requirement so let me just keep it 10 for now now these are the scale out and scale in conditions that we have discussed previously so if cpu utilization is 75 or let's just use 80 and it will be there for an average of 10 minutes that means it's not like there was a spike and it reached to the 80 percent and it spin up the vm no it will be calculated based on the time duration that we have mentioned over here so it will wait for the 10 minute period and then it will see if the cpu utilization is 80 percent over a period of 10 minutes then only it will increase the number of instances by one again these all fields are customizable the same way there is a scaling policy if the cpu utilization is below 25 percent then it will decrease the number of vm by one right so these were the only difference that it had so then you can review everything and hit review and create once you do that it will initially have three vms and based on the scale in and scale out policy and condition it will uh, provision and decommission the vm so that's it for virtual machine scale sets now let's have a look at availability sets in availability sets uh, your virtual machines are spread across multiple physical servers in a data centers to provide high availability it spreads across multiple fault domains and update domains now let's have a look at the fault domain and update domains so as you see over here in this diagram fault domains are nothing but your physical server racks and they are connected to the same uh, power source or switches etc and update domains so let's divide this physical rack into multiple partitions so these are your multiple update domains and these update domains are nothing but the group of servers that reboots or restart at the same time to perform any schedule maintenance so you have vm1 in update domain 1 you have your vm2 in update domain 2 and you have your vm3 in update domain 3 so if there is a failure of a complete server rack let's say this one goes out then you have your vm2 and vm3 still available to serve the load and let's say if there is an update domain failure like this one goes out then you have your vm1 and vm3 ready to serve the load so this is how you can achieve even high availability and fault tolerance using fault domains and update domain. Azure Virtual Desktop is a type of managed virtual machine that enables multiple users to access desktop and application from anywhere using any device. So you can access it via tablet, Windows machine, a Linux machine and so on. It also supports application and desktop virtualization that runs on the cloud. It provides a scalable and secure solution for remote work and desktop virtualization. And your system is secure through multi-factor authentication and role-based access control. So role-based access control is nothing but providing the least privileged access to the users with the help of roles. For example, developers get certain roles to access the virtual machine and your operator gets a certain access and the access is based on the type of role that a person is part of. Now let's have a look at the difference between Azure Virtual Desktop and Azure Virtual Machine. So we will be looking the differences in these three areas. First is operating system. Your Azure Virtual Desktop uses desktop operating system like Windows 10 or 11. However, Azure Virtual Machine can use either desktop or server operating system such as Windows Server 2012, Windows Server 2016 and so on. Azure Virtual Desktop is designed for many users to access the same virtual desktop. With the help of Windows 10 and 11 multi-session server, you, you can enable concurrent access to multiple users to the same Azure Virtual Desktop. However, Azure Virtual Machine is intended typically for the individual user at one time. This is a managed service that means your upgrades, patches and all the system maintenance will be done by Microsoft. Azure Virtual Machine is IES service and it is managed by customer. For 
Azure Virtual Desktops charges per user per month and it provides the flexibility to organization with changing needs. However, the virtual machines are pay per use model. Before we start containers, let's talk about how a virtual machine is provisioned. So you have your physical server that sits somewhere in the data center in case of a public cloud or your personal desktop. On top of that, you have an operating system that lets you interact with the physical machine such as Windows or Linux. Then you have your hypervisor which makes this virtualization possible. Now, what exactly is virtualization? Well, it allows you to run multiple operating system instances concurrently on a single computer. That means you can run Ubuntu, Fedora, CentOS all at the same time on top of your Windows machine with the help of virtualization. In case of a public cloud, your physical server over here is a shared hardware that is being used by multiple organizations and users at the same time. When you request provisioning a virtual machine through a cloud console, it lets you provision a guest VM on top of the hypervisor. But at the same time, other users and organizations are also using the same physical hardware underneath with a separate guest VM. Each user install binaries and libraries on top of it and then your application. A virtual machine is a software emulation of a physical machine which allows multiple operating system to run on a single physical machine. Virtual machines are also isolated from each other and from the host machine which provides security and stability. Now if we talk about containers, it has the same physical server underneath and host operating system on top of that. But instead of a hypervisor, it has something called as container engine. Well, container engine allows you to run multiple container instances on a single operating system kernel. It works the same way as hypervisor, but for containers. As hypervisor is for running multiple virtual machines on a single operating system, container engine allows you to run multiple container instances on a single operating system. Container has a lot of advantages like they are lightweight alternative to virtual machines with all the required libraries and binaries packed within. Containers share the host operating system kernel which makes them more efficient and portable than virtual machines. I hope you are enjoying the video till now and you have liked this new concept of animation and graphics. So if you did, let me know in the comment section and if I get 500 likes in this particular video, then I will try to make all my upcoming concept part of the videos in the same format. What are you waiting for? Go ahead and give it a thumbs up and let's continue with the video. Now let's quickly see how container instances work and then we will jump into the demo. Your development team packages your application along with binaries, libraries and configuration into a container image. These images are then uploaded or pushed to a container repository. It could be a private repository such as Azure Container Instances or a public repository such as Docker Hub. Then using the Azure portal, you deploy these images from the repository to Azure Container Instances, which is a platform as a service. That means all the admin work such as upgrading, patching and infrastructure management will be done by Azure for you and you just have to worry about your code and containers. Azure Container Instances allow you to upload your containers and then the service will run the containers for you without you worrying about the underlying infrastructure. All right, so I have logged into my Azure portal and I'm just gonna create a new resource by clicking over here. And the resource type would be Container Instances. So I'll search Container Instances over here, this one, and then click create. Now it will ask you your basic details such as your subscription detail. I'll use the existing resource group or you can create a new one. Give this container instance a name. So test demo AZ 900. And then you select a region. 
I just let it provision itself in the default region. There are three types of image sources over here. Quick start images, which are basically the pre-built templates created for you and you can use it for your testing purpose, such as a hello world Linux image over here or an Nginx image or a Windows Server image. And you can choose from either of those. Or if you have an image already uploaded to the Azure Container Registry, this is your private registry. So you can choose from there as well. You provide the container registry details like name. If you already have it created in your Azure account, then it will be visible over here in the drop down. Or if you have access to it, then the image that you would want to use and the image tag, all those things. Or you can use any other repository as well like a public or a private repository. If it is a public repository, that means it will be by default from the Docker Hub. Or if it is a private repository, then you can provide the repository details like the login server, username and password, right? For this demo, I just wanted to show you all, diff all the different sources that we can use as part of Azure Container Instances. And I'm gonna go ahead with the quick start image, which is uh, basically a Hello World Linux image. And here are the size details of this Azure container instance, your virtual CPU and memory. It doesn't have any GPUs and you can change the size as well. And next is networking. If you would want your application to be accessible over the public internet, then you choose public else go with the private option and fill in all the other details. Next is advanced section, which has a few basic Docker related commands that you can enter. But uh, for this demo, just this one is sufficient and you review everything and click on review and create. It says validation passed and then you can click create. All right, it took few seconds and then your deployment is completed. Now let's go to the resource. and your container is running, that start button is disabled. That means it is currently running. You can restart it, stop it or delete it from here. And on the left pane, you have all the other details like containers over here. If you click on that, so this is the name that we gave to the container instance and it has, and it has one container running with the image that we have used. These were the events that happened, like it pulled the image and then it started the container. And if you want to connect to this container, you click over here to the connect button. And you can just SSH into the container basically, or if you want to see logs, you can view it from here. Like it says your container is listening on port 80. And here are the properties as well. Let's go back to the overview button again. And here is the IP address on which the container is listening on port 80. So let's copy this and paste that into our web browser over here on port 80. And here is our container listening on port 80. So it is just a static website that was part of the quick start image that we have used. Let's quickly see what exactly is Azure function. Azure function is an event driven serverless compute service. Now let's have a look at each of these one by one. So event driven means it is executed based on certain events, such as you want your function to be executed as soon as there is a file uploaded to the Azure blob storage. That is why it is called event driven. There are different type of events that it supports. So it could be a HTTP based event or it could be a time based event like execute this function at the certain time at a certain day, such as like a cron syntax, or it could be, you know, message from other service like Azure event grid or Azure or queue storage and so on. Serverless means like for your virtual machines and your containers, these are also the compute service. So to run these type of services, you need to have an underlying VM 
that VM has to be running in order to execute your code in order to make your website or your application accessible to the user. But as your Azure function is serverless, that means you don't need to manage an underlying virtual machine or underlying infrastructure to run your Azure functions. So for example, let's say you have a user and this user uploaded a file to Azure blob storage. Don't worry about this. We will have a look into the Azure blob storage and all the storages later in this uh, video series. But for now, just consider this blob storage is, is an Azure storage to store binary large objects such as images, files, log files, text files, all those things. So it is similar to AWS S3. If you have worked with AWS before, let's say the user uploads a file to this and you want as soon as there is a file uploaded to this uh, Azure blob storage, there is an email that is triggered after this particular event. So this file upload is a event as we have seen that Azure function is event driven. So this is kind of a trigger to this Azure function and Azure function will be watching this Azure blob all the time. Right. And as soon as it finds that event, as soon as it finds that trigger, it executes that Azure function and triggers the email. So that is how Azure function works. Now I have also created another video, like an in-depth video about Azure function. If you want to look into it, feel free to check that out. And I will put the link in the description section as well as up somewhere in the title bar. So have a look at that. And Azure function has a lot of benefits over Azure virtual machines or containers. First is it is cost effective as you don't have to manage the infrastructure plus the virtual machine is not running all the time and it saves all the cost. You only pay for the number of code executions. So in Azure function, you write your piece of code and you get charged based on the number of times the code get executed. It also provides faster response than Azure virtual machines or containers, but it is used only in cases where your application shouldn't be running all the time and it is event driven. Right? You want your function to be executed based on certain events or based on certain time of the day, like a cron job, but the execution is really fast and it is also highly scalable. That means that means it can support a large number of requests from the upstream system. And it is really flexible, like you can do a lot of things with it because you can choose your own programming language and you can write code as per your requirement. Right? So this is how it works. And let's jump into the demo and see how we can create an Azure function. All right, so I'm in my Azure portal, portal.azure.com. And you can click over here, create a new resource or from here, as I can see my recently used services from here, or you can search from the search bar, right? So let's do that. And click create. Now, like any other Azure service, it will ask you certain details such as your subscription, your resource group. Let me create a new resource group for this demo. AZ 900. Use. And I'll hit OK. Now we have to provide this function app a unique name because it will be accessible to this particular DNS. Right. So let's give it a name. AZ 900 function. And it is not available. So let's call it hyphen 101 and it says it is available. So we are good. Now there are two options to publish the Azure function. We can write our own code or we can also upload a Docker container. So for this demo, let's use the default option with the code and then select a runtime stack. There are different options available for us. 
So let me just choose Python for this. And there is Python version that we can select like 3.7 to 3.10. So let me select the default version, which is also the latest Python version. Then the region, let me just keep it default operating system, Linux. And then you select the plan type as serverless. So there are different other options, premium app service plan and serverless. So this is what we need because we want to create an Azure serverless function so that we don't have to worry about managing the infrastructure, right? Click hosting. If you want to view your uh, logs generated by Azure function, then you create a storage account, which will store all the logs for you. Like I'll just let it create a new storage account for this and then hit networking. Then the same thing, it will ask me if I need this function to be publicly accessible or no. And like rest of the default options and I'll hit review and create. It will do the validations. And once it is validated, I can hit create to create the Azure function app. All right, it says your deployment is completed. Let's go to the resource. And it says the status is running. Okay, and it has created an app service plan for you. App service plan, we will look into the details when we do the web app session of this course. But for now, this is not really important. And you click over here to Azure functions. And now we will create a new Azure function by clicking over create. Okay, so first there are different options for development environment, VS code, any editor plus code tool or develop in portal. So I'll just keep it default, which is develop in portal. Then there are different templates. So if you remember, I have told you there are different triggers that we can use as part of Azure function. First trigger is HTTP trigger or a time-based trigger, or there could be trigger from other Azure services such as Azure queue, service bus, service bus topic trigger, and so on, right? So for this demo, let me just choose this one, HTTP trigger, and hit create. Now, it was really fast. It, it took like some microseconds and it created the function for me. Now go over here to code and test. Let me just uh, minimize these logs. So here is the default Azure function that was generated for you. It is like a default template because we have used that HTTP trigger as the template. So this was generated uh, with that. And this is the init.py file and there is function.json file which has other trigger based parameters. So if you want to visualize this function, you click over here to integration section. So it will have a trigger, which is an HTTP trigger. You can add some inputs and outputs. So for this particular uh, demo, we have kept the default output, which is an HTTP return. It will return the standard output. You can also configure some third party service if you want this function to send some request to any other function such as email or an SMS or anything else, right? The same way you can configure your inputs as well. So let me go back to code and test and just try to execute this function. Right? So there is this option over here which says test and run. I'll click on that. Different options like uh, the type of method and key. Let's keep it default. And this is the input and the response will be over here. Okay, so over here, I'll add a new parameter to be passed in the, in the request. The parameter name is name and value is like Piyush. And then I hit run. Once I do that, it send HTTP response code as 200. That means the call is successful and it triggered hello name, the HTTP function executed successfully. So this was the test function that was executed as per the request. And 
if you see the bottom of the screen, here are the logs like executing this function programmatically via the host APIs and it sent the invocation, posting invocation ID and it processed the request. As simple as that, if you see over here, it says it took only 48 milliseconds to process the request to execute the function. Yes, it was a really simple function, but even then it was really fast. And if there is an application, if there is an event based trigger, it will be faster as compared to other compute services. Now, if you are following me along with this video and you are testing this in your Azure portal, don't forget to delete the resources after the demo is done. So I'll go back to the resource group. The simplest way is to just delete the entire resource group and all the resources within it will be deleted. So I'll just go to my resource group and the resource group name was AZ900 with Piyush. And inside that I'll hit delete resource group option. Then enter the name of the resource group. I can just copy it from here and paste it, hit delete delete and that's it. So this is what you have to do to delete all the resources that we have just provisioned as part of this demo. All right. So we will start with the basics of what exactly is Azure App Services. Azure App Service is a platform as a service. It is mainly used to build and host your applications in any supported programming language. You can build four types of Azure App Services such as web apps using Azure Web Apps background jobs using Azure web jobs, mobile backends using mobile apps and RESTful APIs using API apps. So we will be looking into these four app services in detail in the next slides. It also supports automatic scaling and high availability. Some more features of Azure app services includes the support for Linux and Windows. It supports both the operating systems so that user can focus only on the build and maintenance of your application and Microsoft will focus on maintaining your infrastructure and to make sure that your environment is healthy all the time. Let's have a look at the first one, which is Azure Web Apps. Web Apps provide full support of hosting web applications. It supports uh, following programming languages such as ASP.NET Core, ASP.NET, Java, Ruby, Node.js, Python and PHP. It also supports Windows as well as Linux operating system. The next one is API apps. You can use REST based web APIs by using your choice of language and framework. It provides full swagger support and the ability to package and publish your APIs in Azure marketplace and apps created by API apps can be consumed by any HTTP or HTTPS based clients. The next one is web job, which is similar to a cron job in Linux. That means it can be scheduled or triggered manually. You can use Azure web jobs to run a program, for example, an exe file, a Java program, a PHP or a Node.js program. You can also use it to run your scripts such as dot cmd dot bat file powershell or even bash scripts the ideal use case of using azure web jobs is to run any background task or jobs the next one is mobile apps as the name suggests it enables you to build a backend for your ios or android application you can also store app data in a cloud based sql database and it provides user authentication using social providers such as Microsoft Authenticator or Google account or a Facebook account. You can use its inbuilt feature to send push notifications and you can also execute custom backend logic in Chash or Node.js. Let's have a look at the pricing plan for Azure service because uh, in the exam, there could be some questions based on this particular slide. So let's have a look. Uh, don't worry about it. You don't have to remember everything. I'll just walk you through it. So from exam point of view, you just have to focus on basic and standard, right? But let's have a look at each one of those and then we'll discuss about the exam perspective. So the free tier and the shared tier, 
both provides you storage of one gigabyte each. They don't support any number of instances. That means they come with the default one instance per app service. Free tier does not support customized domain, but tier tier does. And they both do not support auto scaling support because we don't have any number of instances. They run on the shared hardware. That means the underlying operating system shared by other users and other organizations as well. And they do not support hybrid connectivity. Right? Now, if we talk about the basic plan, it provides 10 times more storage than free or shared plan. And it comes with support of up to three instances, but you cannot use auto scaling in this as well. And it runs on a dedicated hardware. Now, if we compare the basic and standard plan, standard plan has 50 GB of storage and you can have up to 10 instances. It supports auto scaling, customized domain, and it also runs on a dedicated compute. When there is a scenario given in the exam, which focuses more on the auto scaling requirements, and you have to achieve that into the least possible cost, then standard would be the ideal choice. If you do not need auto scaling, but you need customized domain, and you can have a max of three instances, if that is your requirement, then basic plan would be the ideal choice. Obviously, you cannot remember each one of those. So just keep these two in mind and you should be good. Alright, so I have logged into my Azure portal and I'm going to go ahead and create a new resource of type app services. Click on create over here and then enter the basic details as we do for any Azure resource such as create a new resource group. Give it a name AZ900 with Fuge RG. Hit OK. Then give this web app a unique name, AZ900 with Fuge. And then we have three options to publish our code. We can directly upload our code over here and select a runtime stack, or we can use a Docker container, or we can even use a static web app. Right? So for this demo, we will be using a Docker container. And as we have seen in the concept section of this video, it supports both Linux and Windows operating system as the underlying host. So I'll go with the default Linux host. And here is the region, which is let me keep it default East US. And then there is a Linux plan. Linux plan is a type of app service plan. It app service plan will have different resources such as your uh, vCPUs, your RAM storage and all the resources that a machine would have. Right? So if we already have an app service plan created, we can use the same to provision multiple Azure web apps. But because we are using it for the first time, it will create one for us. And then here is the pricing plan. Pricing plan is based on the pricing tier that we have just seen. So based on that, it will choose a pricing plan for you. If you want to explore the pricing plan and see the difference between those, just click over here, explore pricing plans, and it will show you the different options, right? So how much uh, CPU is available, how much memory is available, remote storage, and, and all those things. You can sort it by the feature view as well, right? So there is the free plan, basic plan, premium plan, isolated, and, and there are other categories as well, such as dev test, production. So in this plan, basic B1, it says it has three instances and it has 10 gigs of storage. So I'll go ahead with the basic B1 plan. Once I select it over here, I just have to hit select. And then click on next, the Docker options. We can use a single container or a Docker Compose if we want to create a mini cluster of for multiple Docker containers. And image source could be a quick start guide or an Azure container registry or a public registry such as Docker Hub or even a private registry. So I'll just go ahead with this one. 
and choose a sample nginx image for our web app deployment and rest everything uh, let me keep it default and hit review and create and create so it says deployment is in progress now and it says it's been completed so let's go ahead to the resource and on the left side you will have all the details and if you want to browse your application that's been deployed as a docker container you can just hit browse and your app will be open on the dns that you have specified as the name of your web app and then the suffix will be azure websites dot net so this azure website dot net is the public domain that it comes with but as we have seen earlier some pricing tier supports customized domain as well so this is okay for your learning and for your poc environments but for production grade environment you would need a customized domain support let's have a look at some other things such as if you go down you will see the instance count as one right it can go up to three instances but the initial instance count is one it is deployed in only one instance at the moment it is not deployed in a high availability environment you can always scale up and use a bigger instance for example with more memory and more ram if that is your requirement and you can always stop restart or delete your web application from here on the left side if you see we have deployment slots this particular pricing tier does not support deployment slots so that is why it is asking us to upgrade to a premium or standard plan so that we can add slot so let me give you a brief introduction about the deployment slot so let's say you have one deployment slot v1 which is your production app right your all the production traffic is redirecting to this version you create a new slot let's call it v2 and you deploy your code on this one so this environment will become your staging environment now to save the downtime and to make sure that your users are not impacted with the production release you can just make a swap between the version v1 and v2 so this v2 then becomes your production version and v1 will become your staging version and then you can decommission v1 right so v2 is the live version so this is what this swap means and from here you can add the slots when you upgrade the plan to a standard or a premium plan let's start with the very basics of azure networking azure virtual network is a cloud based network environment in microsoft azure it allows you to create and manage your own isolated network environment in the cloud you can further segment your network into one or more sub networks called subnets and allocate a portion of your virtual network address space to each subnet for example if you have 256 ip addresses in your virtual network you can create subnet a with 64 ips subnet b with another 64 ips and rest of the ips you can use later to create more subnets you can then deploy Azure resources in a specific subnet such as virtual machine in subnet A and database server in subnet B. It enables you to connect your virtual machines, databases and other resources securely either within the same virtual network or across different virtual networks. By default resources within the same virtual network have access to each other. You can secure resources within subnets using network security groups and create inbound and outbound rules to filter the network access. For example, allow everyone access to this virtual machine over the public internet on port 80 and 443 and only allow SSH access from a specific IP range on port 22. Rest of the incoming connections will be blocked. For the other subnet you can have a network security group that allows only the ssh access from the specific cidr range on port 22 and public access will be blocked now let's move on to azure portal and create a virtual network all right so i have logged into my azure portal i'm gonna go ahead and create a new resource i'll search for virtual network or vnet over here 
and click over here create then enter the basic details such as your subscription resource group let's create a new resource group test az 900 resource group click ok now enter your instance name test instance region let's keep it default hit on next ip addresses and by default if you see it allocates the space 10.0.0 slash 16 which has 65536 ip addresses so let me just delete this default ip address space and create a new one 10.0.0.0 slash 21 that has less number of IPs than 65,536. If you know the IP address calculation, you can watch my another video, the link in the description as well as in the title bar. Feel free to check that out. But for this particular exam, you don't need to know the IP address calculation. Just remember that VNet IP address space is the superset and the subnet IP address space is the subset. Right? So let's go ahead over here and create a new subnet. Each virtual network should have at least one subnet. I deleted the default one so that we can create a new one. So just click over here, add subnet and give this subnet a name. Let's call it subnet A. Enter your subnet address range over here, which should be the subset of your VNet address range. So over there, we use 10.0.0.0 slash 21. Over here, let's put 2.0 slash 28 right and this range will have 11 ip addresses plus 5 ip addresses will always be reserved by azure for future use and click over here add so i'm gonna just create one subnet in this vpc for the demo purpose then click over here security this says uh, bastion host ddos protection firewall everything is disabled by default let's keep it that way and hit review and create and then create okay so our uh, vnet has been created click over here to go to the resource so here are the details and then if you go on the left side there is the address space as well it says this is the address space of your vnet it has 2048 ip addresses out of which we used around 16 for subnet A, here is your subnet. Again, it says subnet A has 11 IP addresses. You can add more subnets as well after the VNet is created. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, there is an option which says diagram. Here your network diagram will be generated for you. Currently, it only has a virtual network and a subnet. That is why that is what it's showing over here. But when you have more resources, when you create a virtual network, there'll be a network interface card created with it. And there are some other things. So it will show over here in a hierarchical diagram. So that's it for uh, this demo. And don't forget to clean up the virtual network. Just go back to the overview and hit delete. And delete the virtual network. You can keep it as well. There is no charge associated with using just the virtual network. You will be charged based on the instances and the resources that you use as part of it, like the storage instance and all those things. So let's start with virtual network peering. Let's suppose you have three virtual networks, virtual network A, VNet B and VNet C with one default subnet in each of the VNets and virtual machines in each of them. So you have the resource deployed globally among multiple regions in different VNets. Azure Virtual Network Peering is a feature that allows you to connect two or more virtual networks in the same region or different regions. This feature enables virtual machine from different VNets to communicate with each other over their private IP. This means that traffic is internal and never leaves the Microsoft barebone network. 
which makes it secure. This is particularly useful when you have different workloads that need to communicate with each other but are deployed in separate virtual networks. All the virtual machines inside these connected VNets behave as if they are on the same virtual network. Now let's have a look at virtual private networks. Let's suppose you have resources deployed inside an Azure network as well as on on-premises network and you have to connect them via a secured encrypted network. In that case, you can use VPN. You deploy a service called VPN Gateway on the Azure side and a service called Local Network Gateway on your on-premises. Now using the public IP of your local gateway device, you can create an encrypted site-to-site -site IPsec tunnel. This is your VPN connection which connects these two networks over the public internet but through an encrypted channel. Now if you want to connect your users or clients to Azure through a secure channel, then you create a point-to-site VPN connection. Express Route is a dedicated connection that lets you extend your on-premises network into the Microsoft Cloud. Over here is your on-premises network and here is your Office 365 like your Microsoft services as well as your Azure virtual network. So Express Route lets you connect these networks together through a dedicated line. Right? There is a partner edge And then there is a Microsoft Edge. It creates an express route circuit between these. So this is a primary express route circuit. And it creates a connection to that. And that connection connects with the virtual network. Then the second part of this primary circuit will let you connect your on-premises network with the Microsoft Office 365 services. In the same way, you can have a secondary connection and it will also have two links, one with the Office 365 and another one with the virtual network. So this secondary connection is helpful in case when your primary goes down then the traffic will be redirect from the secondary circuit. Right? Express route has a lot of benefits over your VPN gateway or a VPN connection. For example, these connections are highly reliable. It provides faster speed, lower latencies, and higher bandwidth. This connection supports up to 10 Gbps, which is a lot and this is not the case with a VPN gateway. So these are all the use cases of using an express route over a VPN gateway, but this solution is costlier than VPN gateway. The other important benefit of using an express route is it does not go over the public internet. This connection over here that we see, this is a dedicated connection. That means it doesn't go over the public internet. So it provides a dedicated connection between your on-premises and your Microsoft data center. Hence, this connection is more reliable than VPN gateway. Now that we have seen Azure Express Route, now let's have a quick introduction of Azure DNS or Domain Name Server. So Azure does not let you purchase the domain from the Azure DNS itself, but you can use app service to buy a domain for a yearly fee, right? So your user can go and purchase the domain from Azure app service or through a third party domain registrar such as GoDaddy or HostGator or Namecheap and so on. Once the domain is purchased, you can use Azure DNS to host your domain. You can host the domain. 
it lets you manage your DNS zones. You can also create private DNS domain using Azure DNS. And you can also manage your records. It also supports alias records so that you can refer an Azure resource using a domain name instead of an IP. You can store a massive amount of unstructured data in Azure. Unstructured data means there are no restrictions on the kind of data it can hold. It could be a video file, text file, images, binaries, log files, and so on. As these files does not have a fixed structure, it's called blobs or binary large objects. Blobs are uploaded to a blob container for secure and fast access. Think of a blob container as a folder or a bucket that holds multiple blobs where a blob is an actual data file that you want to store. Blob is an object based storage and your blobs can be accessed by your client applications and users over a secured HTTP or HTTPS connection. Right, let's quickly do a quick recap of the blob storage that we have just seen. So blob storage is used to serve images or documents directly to a browser such as a static website hosting using a content delivery network. It is also used to store files for distributed access. And you can also stream videos and audios directly from your blob storage because those are also the static files. And it is also used to store data for backup and restore disaster recovery and for archiving purpose. You can also store data for further analysis by an on-premises or Azure hosted service. So there are a lot of use cases of using an Azure blob storage. So this is what we have seen so far for Azure blob storage. It will be similar to a blob storage, but instead of blobs, we have files in Azure file storage. Instead of uh, containers, we have file shares. So these are called file shares. And this is file share B. The other difference is how the files are accessed by the application and by the user. So in blob, it was accessed over HTTP or HTTPS, whereas in Azure file storage, it is accessed over your NFS or SMB protocol. Right? So think of it as mounting your file share as a network drive on multiple computers over cloud or on premises. So like you have your, let's say these two are your VMs. There is a file share over here. So you can mount this file share to both the VMs at the same time. So this is how you would use an Azure file share. This is, if you have worked with AWS before, this is similar to Elastic file storage. Now let's quickly recap about Azure file storage. Well, it enables you to create file shares in the cloud and access these file shares from anywhere with an internet connection. Azure file storage exposes file share using SMB 3.0 protocol or NFS protocol. Once you have created a storage account, you can upload files to Azure file storage using the Azure portal or tools such as AZ copy. You can attach a network drive to multiple computers. And this is what file storage will do for you. It has two performance tier based on your cost and performance requirements. The first one is standard tier, which is a hard disk based hardware in the data center like SDD for slower performance, but lower cost. It also has a premium tire which uses SSDs and it provides a greater throughput, but it is costlier than the standard tier. Based on your performance and cost requirement, you can put your Azure file storage in either of those tiers. Now let's have a look at Azure queue storage. Let's suppose you have an application that performs a certain number of tasks, task one, task two, and task three. 
these tasks are then passed to azure queue storage in terms of messages it becomes messages when transferred to queue storage the size of each message can go up to 64 kb then these messages are then transferred to a azure service for further processing such as azure function and it performs the asynchronous processing on these messages so this process is called asynchronous processing of the messages so this is how an azure queue storage works you can store a massive amount of semi structured data in azure as well semi structured data means no sql data that does not require a fixed schema such as a json file document based data a key value pair based data and so on as these files do not have a fixed schema and does not use sql concepts such as foreign key joins and relationships data is uploaded to azure table inside a storage account for fast and secure access so we have seen azure queue storage azure file storage azure blob storage and azure table but all these storages are part of a bigger storage service which is storage account so storage account can have multiple tables blobs file and queues it is used to store messages files unstructured data and semi structured data in the form of these services that we have just seen it is highly scalable and can hold petabytes of data storage account name should be unique within azure so this would be a sample endpoint of an azure service the first block is your storage account name which is what we have seen should be a unique name the second is type based on the service that we have used either table blob file or queue so that would be the type over there and the last part would be same for like whatever service you are using so it will remain the same then we have a concept called storage access tier so based on your performance and cost requirement so you put your azure blobs in one of those access tiers so we have a hot tier cool tier and an archival tier so let's quickly have a look at these two first so in hot tier is the default access storage tier that means when you, whenever you create an azure blob storage this will be selected by default and it is used to access frequently access data like your images your static files that is served by a website and you know website needs to access it frequently so all those use cases are for hot tier it provide highest performance but at the same time it is costliest because it is providing you the fastest performance and lower latency cool tier is used to store infrequently access data and it has to be stored for at least 30 days it is cheaper than hot tier and at the same time it provides a lower performance than hot tier you can migrate your storage from hot tier to cool tier to save the storage cost so keep that in mind if you want to save the cost but you can compromise with the data access performance then you can just migrate it from hot tier to cool tier then the next one is archival tier archival tier cannot be set at the account level you can set it on the blob level it is used for archival storage as the name suggest but you should have the data at least stored for 180 days to be used as archive tier then it has the highest latency because it is cheapest among all and it takes hours for the data retrieval and you cannot directly just use the data from archive tier you first have to change it from hot tier or cool tier then the blob will be rehydrated that's the process that it performs and you can only read the blob only when the rehydration process is completed so this process takes art based on the size and length of the data and it is cheapest among all so you use or uh, this tier when you don't have to retrieve the data instantly it is generally used for archival 
for audit and compliance purpose or long term retrieval of your logs and so on. Now we have a concept called Azure Storage Redundancy. Azure always stores multiple copies of your data so that it is protected from planned and unplanned events such as hardware failures, network or power outage or natural disasters. You select the redundancy option based on your cost and your availability requirement. The first one is locally redundant storage which replicates your data three times within a single data center in the primary region. Even if two copies of your data gets corrupted, you still have the data available through the third copy. It provides the service in least cost and offer least durability. Because if your data center fails, the data will be lost. Then we have another option which is zone redundant storage. Zone redundant storage replicates your Azure storage data synchronously across three Azure availability zones in the primary region. Then we have geo redundant storage which in which your data is replicated to a secondary region so that your data will be highly available if there is a region failure as well. So this is done through geo replication within secondary region. There is also a read access geo redundant storage which is RAGRS in which data of your secondary region is read only to save some storage cost. And there is a geo zone redundant storage in which the primary region data is replicated in multiple availability zone and secondary region is just locally redundant storage that means it is replicated across three locations within the same data center. So you choose your redundant option based on your availability and your cost requirement. A traditional on-premises infrastructure would have servers and database running on either VMware or Hyper-V or physical servers. There are various data migration options provided by Azure. First one is Azure Migrate, which performs the initial discovery and assessment and prepares the server for migration. Then it migrates the server running on on-premises or any other public cloud infrastructure to Azure Cloud VMs or web apps. Next option that we have is Azure Database Migration Service, which performs the assessment of SQL servers and help in pointing the potential problems that could block the migration. Then it performs the database migration to Azure VMs running on SQL Server, Azure SQL Database or SQL Managed Database Instances. We also have Azure Data Box, which is used to move large amount of offline data to Azure. So let's have a look at the Azure data box now. Well, it's a physical migration service that helps transfer large amount of data to Azure. This service comes with a physical appliance such as Azure data box, which comes with five SSDs of eight GB each. That means a total of 40 TB it supports. Then we also have Azure data box, which can support around 100 TB of data storage and transfer. Then we also have data box heavy, which can store and transfer up to one petabytes of data. You can simply import your data from on-premises to either of these devices based on your storage requirements and then ship it to Azure data center. Data is then automatically exported to Azure cloud. Once it is exported to Azure, the data within the divides get erased. It's completely wiped out. And main use case of uh, the data box is when you have a large amount of data, typically more than 40 TB. Or when you have a requirement of bulk data transfer, sometimes you also have to store large amount of data in Azure for security and compliance purpose. So all these are use case of using a Azure data box. On and all, it is a reliable, fast and secure transfer service. In addition to large scale migration using services like Azure Migrate and Azure Data Box, Azure also has tools designed to help you move or interact with individual files or small file groups. First one is AZ Copy, which is a command line based utility that lets you interact with Azure Storage to transfer blobs and files to and from Azure Storage accounts. 
well you can upload your data files you can also download the blobs or files from azure storage account and you can also copy the files between storage account and also synchronize the files between storage account but the synchronization process is unidirectional that is this is one way and not bidirectional the next one that we have is azure storage explorer it's a gui based application and in the back end it is using az copy command line tool to perform the data transfer to and from azure storage account you can simply do drag and drop uh, using the gui and then you don't have to run the az copy commands from the command line then we have azure file sync we use azure file sync when we have to synchronize the files between your local windows server and azure files in the azure storage account and this sync process is bidirectional that means both the ways and it is used to sync only the files not blobs not any other data type just files and from your local windows server to azure file so you install this azure file sync agent on your local windows server and then it performs the file sync for you first let's have a look at the basics of identity authorization and authentication an identity could be a person, a device, a computer, a functional ID, or anything that access your application. When you try to sign in to your application by using an authentication method such as username and password, a request goes to an authorization server that validates your authenticity. It checks whether you are who you say you are and not someone impersonating you. If the validation is successful, you are logged in and this process is called authentication then you try to access an application or a service request goes to the auth server again and checks if you have the access or not if you have the access then access is granted and you should be able to access that service or application this process is called authorization that means whether you are authorized to perform certain operations or not. So this is the normal process of identity, authentication and authorization. It becomes difficult to manage your identities when you have your application running on multiple platforms and environments. For instance, you need to access your Office 365 applications or Microsoft applications such as Microsoft Teams and your workload is running into Microsoft Azure. So you have your workloads and applications running on multiple platforms and services. You would need a centralized server which takes care of your identity management. This is where Active Directory comes in. Well, Active Directory is something that you host on premises on a Windows server, but if you need similar capabilities in cloud, Azure Active Directory is the service for you. It's a managed cloud-based identity and access management offering by Azure. It comes with a lot of features such as authentication, authorization, single sign-on, which means you can use the same credential to log in into multiple platforms and applications as it provides a centralized user management system. It also provides capabilities of self-service password reset and multi-factor authentication, which means you need to provide extra details on top of your credential to authenticate yourself as a valid identity, such as OTP sent to your phone or email, key generated by a soft token or hard token, some security questions that you have set during the registration, your PIN, CAPTCHA verification, all these are using multi-factor authentication. It provides an extra layer of security for logging to your application. There is one more service which is called Azure AD Identity Protection that forces the user to change the password if the login location or source IP is unidentified. Again, this is to protect your identity as a user so that your application is secure enough and no unauthorized user should be able to penetrate the system. Now let's talk about Azure Active Directory Connect. If you had an on-premises environment running Active Directory and a cloud deployment using Azure Active Directory, you would need to maintain two identity set for the same identity. However, you can connect Active Directory on-premises and Azure Active Directory 
enabling a consistent identity experience between cloud and on-premises. Users can use a single identity to access on-premises application and cloud services such as Microsoft Office 365. One method of connecting Azure AD with your on-premises AD is using Azure AD Connect or Azure Active Directory Connect service. Azure AD Connect synchronizes user identity between on-premises Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. So you can use the services like single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, self-service password reset under both the systems, which also eliminates the need for managing same identities in multiple places. Let's talk about Azure Active Directory domain service. A managed domain is configured to perform one-way synchronization from Azure Active Directory to Azure Active Directory domain service. You can create resources directly in the managed domain, but they aren't synchronized back to Azure. In hybrid environment, with an on-premises Active Directory domain service environment, Azure AD Connect synchronizes the identity information with Azure AD, which is then synchronized to the managed domain. This is a one-way synchronization from Azure Active Directory to Azure Active Directory domain services. That means any changes happen at the source location would reflect in the destination as well, but not the other way around. Also, this service provides managed domain services such as domain join, group policy, LDAP authentication, and also some advanced authentication mechanisms such as Kerberos and NTLM. So these advanced authentications are not provided with Azure AD Connect or Azure Active Directory. So if you need to have a managed domain service, then you use Azure AD domain service. Make sure you understand the difference between Azure Active Directory, Azure AD domain service and Azure AD Connect service. This exam would not validate your skills on in-depth level of these services, but you should know the basics of these and when to use which service. So there are resources in Azure such as virtual machine, databases, Azure function, Azure web app and so on. And you need to perform certain tasks on each of these resources such as start stop virtual machine, edit virtual machine, view virtual machine and so on. Assigning each of these permissions manually to a user is a tedious and inefficient task. Instead, you can group these actions into multiple groups called roles and assign that role to a user. You can also assign multiple roles to a user. In this example, if you want your user to have read-only access to the various resources, you can create a reader role with certain set of permissions such as view virtual machine, view database, read function, and view web app. All of these permissions collectively known as a role that you can assign directly to a user or a group of users. If you remember one of our earlier videos in which we discussed about resource hierarchy, Role can be assigned to management group level, subscription level, resource group level, or even at individual resource level. And if it is applied to a parent node, that means it is inherited by the subsequent children nodes. So if let's say you applied a reader role at management group level, then all the resources, all the object inside this hierarchy, such as the subscription, and this subscription, this resource group, and all the resources would have the reader role by default. So it inherits from parent to child by default, and you can override it. For example, you want only uh, the admin access to this particular resource over here. So you can assign the admin role directly to this resource over here, and for rest of them would have the reader role by default. So these all are nothing but scope. So a scope could be at a management group, a subscription, a resource group, or even individual resources. So we have our scope such as resources, our role such as a reader role, a contributor role, owner role, or a custom role. And then we have our identity on which the role is applied, such as a user, a group of users, manage identity, or even a service principle. So combination of a scope, a role, and an identity is collectively known as a role assignment. Let's head over to the Azure portal and see how a role assignment works. 
All right, so we are logged into our Azure portal on portal.azure.com and we're gonna head over to one of our scope. It could be a subscription, a resource group or a resource. Let me go ahead to this resource group over here, which is backend RG. Once I do that on the left side, you will see different options. So we have to go over here, which says access I am. So this is the place where we provide the role assignment and check the current roles. To do a role assignment. You can click over here, which says add and click add role assignment. Now it will ask you again, those three things that we have asked first is scope scope. We have already selected as a resource group. So that is the default scope for now. And then it will ask you to select the roles. So here are the different roles. It has reader role, access review operator, and there are like a bunch of roles over here. So let me go ahead and select the reader role and then hit over here, which says next. Then it will ask you the identity, whether the role is to be assigned to a user group or service principal or a managed identity. So let me select a user and click over here, which says select members. Now on the right side, it will ask me which member this role needs to be assigned to. So here is a demo user that I have created for this demo. So I'm going to select this. Once I select this, then it will ask you to review and assign the role, right? So again, we have selected three things. First is the role itself, then the identity to which the role is to be assigned and then the scope, which is resource group for this. So I'll click over here, which says uh, review and assign and hit it one more time. Okay. It says added role assignments. Now you can view the existing role assignment from here, which says role assignments. And if I scroll down to the demo user, it says it has the reader role. Now this is the scope over here is this resource, which is a resource group. So if I go to overview section of this resource group and go to a resource inside that resource group, which is this storage account. And again, I go to I am and check the role assignments over here. You see this demo user has a reader role for this resource as well, which is a storage account and it was inherited from the resource group. So this is what we discuss how role is assigned from top to bottom in the hierarchy. And let's say my user Piyush Sajdeva has the owner role on this resource because I am the owner of this subscription. So it is inherited from top to down for that as well. So if I will log in with my demo user, I would have the reader access to this resource as well as the resource group. Let's talk about conditional access. Now you have a user trying to log into your server from either unexpected location or an unknown location or a device. Azure Active Directory treats this as a suspicious activity and prompt the user to provide one or more authentication method such as CAPTCHA or one-time password or even a personal identification security question. Based on the response, it will decide to either grant you full access, limited access or deny access to the requested resource. So this process is called conditional access. All right, let's start the video with cost management introduction. We have already seen capital expenditure and operating expenditure in the beginning of this series where capital expenditure is the upfront cost that you spend and operating expenditure is the recurring cost that you spend over a specific period of time. A number of factors influence the cost of the Azure resources. These factors such as the type of resource, the setting of the resource and the Azure region will have an impact on how much the resource is going to cost. Now let's take an example of a virtual machine. The cost of a virtual machine depends on the virtual machine size, the licensing, the storage and the region in which VM is provisioned and few other factors. So this type of consumption model is called pay as you go where you pay for the resources that you use during a billing cycle. If you use more compute this cycle, you pay more. And if you less in the current cycle, you pay less. 
Azure also provides a option for reserve capacity in which you can commit to use a certain number of resources for a specific period of time. Usually this period is one to three year and you receive huge discount on that commitment. For example, you said, okay, I need 50 virtual machines for the next three years with 80 GB boot disk and 12 virtual CPUs. So this type of model will be reserved model where you are deciding the cost in advance and you'll get a huge discount on the commitment. Let's have a look at uh, Azure Marketplace. Azure Marketplace lets you purchase Azure based solution and services from third party vendors using the Azure portal. So let's say you are a user and you subscribe to a Nginx machine image from the Azure Marketplace. This Nginx image is customized image provided by a third party vendor such as Bitnami or it could be anyone else. And they said, okay, uh, we'll give you Nginx plus on top of that, we'll give you, let's say Prometheus and Grafana pre-configured and you don't have to worry about any licensing cost or any other configuration setup. It is ready to use image and then you just go ahead, subscribe to the image and use it. And for that, uh, we will charge you a nominal fee, let's say $10 per month. This is just for an example. So you will have to pay that fee to the vendor as well as to the Azure for the resources that you are using. Like this Nginx image will be running on a virtual machine. So you'll be paying uh, the cost to Azure and to the third party vendor. And the cost of this uh, image will be decided by third party vendor. How much they're gonna charge you for that. Now let's have a look at another important topic which is cost estimation in Azure. So we have a term called pricing calculator and total cost of ownership TCO. They both are used to estimate cost in Azure, but there is a slight difference between these two. So let's have a look at those differences. So pricing calculator provides you the cost estimation of provisioning Azure resources and total cost of ownership provide you cost comparison between your on-premises infrastructure and the equivalent services in Azure infrastructure. Let's say you have a two on-premises servers and two database servers running on-premises and it will provide you a cost of how much you're gonna save or how much will be the cost you will be incurred when you provision two virtual machines and two database instances in Azure. So that cost comparison will be provided between on-premises and the Azure infrastructure. You can save, export and share the estimates provided by pricing calculator. Before migrating to cloud, you can generate a report using TCO to see if there are any potential savings in moving to the cloud. And then you can download this report and share this report as well. So make sure you understand the difference between these two. Uh, cost management provides the ability to quickly check the Azure resource cost, create alerts based on the resource spends and create budgets, which will also trigger an alert when the budget threshold has been breached. So it also provides cost analysis and you can review your spendings based on service, location, subscription, and so on. So let's start with our video on Azure management and governance. The first topic would be Azure blueprints. Azure Blueprints deploy a new environment based on all of the requirement settings and configuration of the associated artifacts. These artifacts can include things such as role assignments, policy assignments, Azure resource management templates, and resource groups. It also preserves what should be deployed using Blueprint definition and what was deployed using Blueprint assignment. So definition is what should be the desired deployment and assignment is what is actually being deployed. Now let's have a look at Azure policy. Azure policy is a service in Azure that enables you to create, assign and manage policies that enforces rules so that configurations stay compliant. For example, you create a policy which states that you can only create virtual machines in Canada central region. If you try to create that in any other location, it will throw the error. 
Also, it will check if there are any existing virtual machines in any other region. It will throw the error that virtual machines are non-compliant. So these policies audit and control your resources. A group of policy is called an initiative. So you can assign the policy and you can assign the initiative as well. Now the next topic is resource locks. So resource lock is something that prevent resource from being accidentally deleted or modified. It can be applied at multiple levels. So you can apply the resource lock at subscription level over here or resource group level or at individual resources level. But these uh, resource locks are inherited in nature. That means if you have applied it at subscription level, then it is inherited by the subsequent child nodes such as resource group and resources. So there are two type of resource locks, delete lock and a read only lock. Uh, with delete lock, you can only read and modify the resource. But with read only lock, you can only read the resources. You cannot modify or delete it. So read only lock is just like a reader role in Azure. The next topic is service trust portal. Microsoft Service Trust Portal is a portal that provides access to various content, tools and other resources about Microsoft security, privacy and compliance practices. So it also provides you detailed information about how they are protecting cloud services and customers data. You can download all the reports and documents by going over here all documents and you can pin the documents in my library to create a custom view. In this video, we will summarize all the tools that we can use to interact with Azure. So you can use Azure portal by going to portal.azure.com to create and manage your Azure resources. You can also use Cloud Shell to interact with Azure, which is a browser based shell and supports Bash and PowerShell. Both of them basically have the same functionalities. It mostly depends on your familiarity with the scripting language that you want to choose. Azure Portal and Cloud Shell both are browser based utilities, which means you can use these to access Azure resources from any device that has a web browser, such as a phone, a tablet, or even a computer, irrespective of their operating system. For instance, you want to provision a virtual machine using your mobile phone, and you can use either of these methods to provision your virtual machine using your mobile phone. The other CLI based tools you can use are Azure CLI and PowerShell. Azure CLI is a command line based utility that can be installed on Mac, Windows or even Linux and you can authenticate using AZ login commands and access the Azure resources such as Azure web app. In the same way, you can use PowerShell on Windows, Mac or Linux to interact with Azure resources. PowerShell for Mac and Linux was introduced with PowerShell Core 6.0 but now it is out of support and you should use at least PowerShell 7.2 if you want to run it on Mac or Linux. Now let's talk about Azure Arc. Well, it is a service you use to manage multi-cloud and hybrid virtual machines, Kubernetes clusters and databases as if they are running on Azure. So it basically manages your on-premises servers and resources as an Azure resource. The services that are supported by Azure Arc are physical servers, Kubernetes servers, Azure data services, SQL server and virtual machines. So anything that is running on premises out of these supported services can be managed by Azure itself and can be turned into an ARM template for infrastructure provisioning. Now the ARM template is the service we use to provision infrastructure as a code for Azure. For example, as a user, you create an ARM template, which is a JSON based a code template, which has the desired state of your infrastructure. Let's say you want to provision 50 virtual machines into Azure. So you write an Azure ARM template, provide all the details, and then you deploy this. Once you deploy the ARM template, you will get all identical 50 virtual machines created in your Azure subscription. All right, let's talk about monitoring tools in Azure. First one is Azure Advisor. As the name suggests, it evaluates your Azure resources and provides you recommendation to help you improve reliability, security, performance, 
helps you achieve operational excellence and helps you reduce cost. The important thing to remember here is this Azure Advisor service just provide you recommendations based on your existing workload. It does not take any action and you have to take the further actions to correct and to implement those recommendations. The next one is Azure Service Health. Well, Azure Service Health is a dashboard that shows the service health and health of your deployed resources. Service health as in overall health of the Azure resources as hosted in the Microsoft Data Center. It comprises of three components. The first one is Azure Status, which shows the status of Azure services globally and if there is any outage or the service is healthy or not. The next one is Service Health. It focuses on the Azure services and region that you are using and not the global resources. And then we have Resource Health, which shows the health of your cloud resources, such as your virtual machines deployed on Azure and whether it is impacted by any outage or whether they are healthy as per Microsoft. You can even set up service health alerts to notify you when service issues, plan maintenance or other changes may affect the Azure services and region you use. And using Azure Monitor, you can also configure alerts to notify you of availability changes to your cloud resources. So whether there is a resource that went from healthy to unhealthy due to a service outage or not. So these type of alerts you can set easily using Service Health Alert and Azure Monitor Alerts. Now let's have a look at Azure Monitor. Well, Azure Monitor can monitor Azure resources on your on-premises and even multi-cloud resources like virtual machines hosted with a different cloud provider. Data is collected from a various source such as on-premises server, cloud infrastructure and networks and then it is stored in multiple central repositories such as metrics, logs and traces. This data is then used in several ways. You can visualize the data using tools such as Azure Workbook, Grafana, Power BI and dashboards. You can also analyze the data using tools such as Log Analytics and Metrics Explorer and create real-time alerts and take necessary actions on those alerts such as auto scaling groups and other actions. Additionally, you can integrate with different services such as Event Hub, Import Export APIs and Logic Apps to perform some further actions. In a nutshell, the Azure Monitor is a platform for collecting data on your resources, analyzing that data and visualizing the information and even act on those results. Physical infrastructure security, whether it is physical host, physical network or physical servers, it's always Azure's responsibility to take care of those and the cloud user wouldn't have to worry about it. For example, if you look at this below comparison diagram, so it is clearly mentioned what comes under Azure's responsibility and what comes under customer's responsibility and what comes under the shared responsibility model. If you look at the last three lines, physical host, physical network, physical data center, any of those would always be Microsoft responsibility, whether it's IS or PaaS or SaaS. The next one is access to underlying operating system. Only in IAS infrastructure as a service, you will get access to the underlying operating system. And in PaaS and SaaS, you won't get that access. All the comparison has been given over here. You can take the screenshot and read through it or feel free to watch the video as part of AZ900 playlist. It's everything is described in detail. Now let's talk about when it comes to a service uh, which needs high bandwidth and dedicated network between on-premises and Azure. We use Azure Express Route in that case. So make sure to understand the difference between VPN gateway and express route. And uh, this is the costly solution, but at the same time, it provides you high bandwidth and a dedicated network between your on-prem and Azure. The next one is if uh, there is a keyword in the question, which says you need to have a production ready server um, with isolated environment, you know, that can be provisioned with fewer possible steps. So answer is Azure Marketplace, which is a service in 
uh, which the third party vendors provide a custom image with some pre-built infrastructure already installed and you just have to subscribe to that and pay for those services to Azure as well as there is some portion that vendor takes from the bill. The next one is if there is a service with says you need to implement infrastructure as a code for Azure that you can use to launch infrastructure using some reusable code templates then the answer is ARM templates, Azure resource manager templates and Azure Bicep which is a newer service that uh, can be viewed as an extension of ARM or an improved version of ARM template. Okay, if the question talks about the multi-cloud resource management capabilities, then answer is Azure Arc. This is a new service like introduced a couple of years back, but this is uh, important to know. Then uh, when the question talks about minimizing administrative efforts, then answer is either PaaS or SaaS because in IES, user usually takes care of all the administrative tasks such as server patching, upgrade um, and all those things. But in PaaS and SaaS, it is taken care by Microsoft and Azure. IAM policies and permissions can be applied at all levels of resource hierarchy. Uh, what I mean by that is you can apply policies and permissions roles in all those levels like either at root management group, subscription level, resource group level or even at the individual resources level. Okay, when it comes to connecting to virtual crowd network with on-premises with the lowest possible cost, you know, the service that you use is VPN gateway. It does not provide you a dedicated network, but it helps you provide an encrypted IPsec VPN tunnel through which you can connect your on-premises network to the Azure virtual network through an encrypted tunnel. Uh, for cost estimation, Azure provides you a service called Azure Pricing Calculator. There is another service which is total cost of ownership. So make sure to understand the difference between these two. ECO or total cost of ownership uh, focuses on the estimated saving cost when you move from your on-premises to cloud. However, the pricing calculator calculates the estimated cost of your resources that you're going to provision in Azure. So understand the difference between those two. When there is a requirement to host static website on Azure and and or uh, for static content storage, then the service that you would use is Azure Blob Storage. A container based services in Azure are mostly Azure Container Instances or Azure Kubernetes services. There are some other as well, such as Azure Web App, especially the flexible web app part. Uh, it provides you capabilities to host your containers on that. So, you know, try to understand those points as well. And there are several ways through which you can interact with Azure, such as Azure CLI, Azure Cloud Shell, which is built within the Azure portal. And it provides you capability to choose from Azure PowerShell or Azure Bash Shell. And you can also use Azure portal to interact with Azure resources. Ugh. <sighs>